Hi everybody and welcome to the ninth episode of our Walk In My Shoes um, series for our members. My name is Sophia and I'm the Director of Training and Development with Philanthropy Impact. Um, before we start, I just want to take a moment to thank you all for joining us each week, for taking part in the discussions and for your dedication to continue to learn and exchange with us all. We at Philanthropy Impact have been very happily overwhelmed by the response and positive reaction to this series and remain committed to bringing it to you. This series was originally set up for our members as a space for peer support, collaboration and knowledge sharing. And we chose to make every third episode open for the wider network for free to be there in a time of need. However, the growing demand for our services mean that as a not-for-profit, we are unable to continue to deliver this service free of charge for all. We are funded by our events and by our members and as such, we will need to start charging just a, short, a small fee for registration to these events in the future, as we always have done. Our events remain free to our membership base. So if you are interested in becoming a member, get in touch. My email address will be in the chat later and we will be offering registration to non-members for a short, uh, on a pay-as-you-go basis as we do with all of our events. It is only a small fee to ensure that we are able to keep bringing these sessions to you regularly and keep being an organisation that brings much needed thoughtful discussion and debate to the table. It is what we are set up to do and we try to create a reciprocal circle of support and learning empowered by a thoughtful programme of events and to that spark debate and ideas for transformational change. We are really pleased to be reaching so many of you at this time and look forward to working with you more over the coming months. This leads me to introduce the panelists for our um, uh, discussion today. Today we are having, oh, sorry, the person we have chairing today is Sian Haldane, a member, and she is also part of our team of trainers, which I'm really proud to say. And she is the founder of Boone Consultancy. Um, Sian today is joined by member Elizabeth Steinhart from LCM Family, Emma Turner from Barclays, and our member Richard Castle from Withers Worldwide. They are going to be discussing the changing nature of the client needs pre-pandemic. Um, because they were changing before, and also the immediate client's desire to help address the societal and health impacts of this pandemic and the role advisors can play in this. So I will now pass over to Sian, who's going to take on the discussion. Thanks very much, Sophia, and um, hello to everyone. Really delighted uh, to be chairing this session today. Um, as uh, Sophia mentioned, um, I'm a philanthropy consultant and a little bit of context for my background, which might be helpful. Um, I used to uh, be a professional fundraiser and also um, worked as a private client lawyer. So kind of straddled both sides, really. And um, I think that I'm really, really um, almost humbled by the fantastic uh, experience that, that is uh, jointly sort of combined with all of, the, all of the panelists today who've been doing some really, really fantastic work um, in the philanthropy space. And, and specifically today, we're thinking about how to engage new funders um, and the role of professional advisors in this space. And again, context, it's a really challenging time. Um, we know that individuals' assets are reducing, clients are reviewing their wealth strategies, and also at the same time, because the impact of the crisis has been so far reaching, people are turning to their advisors to think about how they can help their communities um, and also potentially sort of the wider community. Um, very interestingly also, we've got um, Emma joining us from Barclays and there was a report on barriers to giving, which really highlighted just how entering the world of philanthropy and social investment is quite daunting and confusing, never mind in this, in this climate. Um, so we really want to kind of draw out a little bit of, of, of that and what, we've, what we heard in that report. Um, so in this discussion, really want to think about the valuable role that professional advisors play in this space. Um, how to meet the immediate needs of clients and how you can support your clients um, in this journey. So I'm going to start with, with you, Emma. Um, have you seen an increase in um, clients um, approaching their advisors and in turn also turning to you about how they can have support on this journey? Um, so first of all, hello, delighted to be here on this nice sunny afternoon. Um, I think because I hold a fairly unique position in that I run the philanthropy service at Barclays Private Bank. That is my full-time day job, Monday to Friday. But I rely on our bankers within the business who are meeting and talking to the clients all the time. So they're the ones that I've had to spend a lot of time training, coaching, 
um, working out best ways to bring up this conversation with clients because it's not their expertise. And what I found when I first went to Barclays, uh, the day that AIG hit the deck, so kind of in not dissimilar circumstances that we find ourselves now, is to um, encourage them to have this conversation rather than to not have it mm -hmm. and to not make the presumption that they, they know whether their client has philanthropic intentions or not because they don't. And after 12 years of doing this job, I, can no I can't draw a straw person that will tell a banker that person in your book is more likely to be philanthropic than that one. So it's our duty of care, if you like, as an advisor, to let every client know that we have a philanthropy service if they want to have a conversation about their giving. And it's fascinating. The most unlikely ones often turn out to be the ones that A, want to have the conversation and engage the quickest and become either new donors or they come off the fence that they've been sitting on for sometimes many years because they've got someone to talk to who can guide them then on the journey that follows. Okay. And what do you think the sort of, um, what are the major concerns sort of that you're hearing right now? Um, so if you've been introduced, I guess, you know, to someone um, through one of the, one of the bankers, are you hearing any sort of themes or? So I think what is remarkable is uh, what, little, uh, what little understanding a lot of clients have of the charity sector. But when you stop to think about it, it sort of makes sense because up until this point in their life, they've been incredibly busy, you know, making money, bringing up families, you know, uh, starting businesses, selling businesses, starting another business, you know, carry, you know uh, developing their own career. And they may be doing a bit of sporadic giving during that journey, but the day that they come to do something is the day they go, oh, hang on a second, I don't know very much about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the greatest brains in the land, they're, they're never able to ask the question, how many charities do we have in the UK? They're never able to answer the question, what's the turnover of the sector? They're never able to answer what's the average donation. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's quite remarkable, or not that remarkable, um, that really it's a big education process um, and there is, I mean, what we found in the research is other than they have their own financial obligations that they have to get squared away first and they can be quite wide and far reaching. It can be down many generations. It can be across a wide level in the family. And then, of course, what we found was there is this lack of faith in charities. And when you peel back the last few years, it's not surprising. I mean, given some of the scandals that we've seen. And then it is about this kind of lack of understanding. So they have a lot of preconceived ideas, which I spend a lot of time helping them understand that they're preconceived and they're wrong and to help them really then turn around their thinking about what to look for in a charity to understand it better and then to be able to support it. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And um, particularly if you think about like there's the different stages, so that kind of planning, kind of understanding, then implementing and then the sort of monitoring and sort of review of what you've sort of put into place. Um, I mean, so it is, it's, it is quite sort of complex and definitely the kind of the report um, highlighted quite a few things and you touched on them like lack of um, worry of lack of transparency and also um, lack of control of how donation might be used. I remember there were lots of really interesting themes there. So I guess with all of all of that in mind, how do you think we can encourage um, more, more wealthy people in the UK to give um, at this point in time? So in my mind, I would just like to see every wealth, I would like to see every wealth manager have a me, basically, because and for me, that will be the definition of success. It's lovely that the few of us that have a me can say that this is a great differentiator. Very few of us do it. You know, we can encourage the clients that we have, but we can't go beyond that. I would love it that it isn't a differentiator, that everybody has some access to a philanthropy advisor, a philanthropy service, because that way you're going to reach thousands more people. And it doesn't take much for these people to become a giver. They're just looking for a bit of hand-holding, Mm -hmm. a bit of class tracking, a bit of in, you know, uh, interesting, understandable information in very straightforward English. And it doesn't take much then to launch them. Yeah, thank you very much. 
Um, Lizzie, turning to you, um, in the context of um, how you work uh, within the family office, um, I'm sure there's probably a lot that um, Emma has said that kind of chimes um, in the mm -hmm. same thing with what you do. But I was wondering, what are the major concerns um, facing the people that you're advising right now? Uh, thank you, Sian. Uh, it's lovely to be here with everyone today to say that. Uh, I think, I mean, obviously we've gone through the last few weeks where people's immediate concerns has been of being close to home with friends and family in their local communities. Uh, there's also the Brexit word still in the background. Working in a multi-family office, uh, many of our clients are business owners and up until COVID-19 are reached our doors. The main concern we were all talking about was how Brexit was going to affect the wealthy of this country. So that's still obviously rumbling along in the background and mustn't be forgotten. Uh, I think one of the, the concerns that's increasing, uh, the conversations that I'm having is, as we've all uh, seen and read and heard in the press, uh, we know that the charity sector is being decimated currently. And the current projection is around 50% of the sector disappearing within the next 12 months are uh, both existing uh, donors and those thinking about giving are asking questions around you know, where do I give? Obviously, they don't want their money to be wasted. So I think that's a real uh, key concern that uh, I'm thinking about and dealing with at the moment. Uh, and I think another genuine concern is uh, a feeling of guilt that uh, clients have around what they should be giving uh, and how they should be giving it. Uh, and I think as an advisor, and I think this is pertinent to all of us, whichever side of the fence we sit on, whether as an advisor or as a fundraiser, uh, we don't want to be in a position in a year's time where our clients come back to us and go, well, why didn't you give us the advice? Why didn't you uh, sort of prick our moral conscience and, and help our, our compass in in going through this process because inevitably at the moment we're all recalibrating we're all thinking about what our values are what's important to us in life and uh i think as a as an advisor within this space whether it's as a wealth advisor or as a private client lawyer or an accountant working with a high net worth we have a real moral obligation as well as a, a professional obligation to be having these sometimes difficult conversations. Uh, I mean, one, one thing that I think uh, I'm really interested at the moment, particularly on, when we look at this subject of, of potentially new donors, is uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been following the CAF research that's been coming out the last few weeks, is uh, they're projecting, or they're saying at the moment, around about 12% of the population are actually wealthier than they were as a result of the COVID-19. Uh, outbreak and that's uh, because people within the wealthy space uh, people have had school fee reductions people aren't going on holidays people aren't going to fancy weddings and parties uh, people have had their memberships put on hold so on an income basis people have got more money in their pocket on a monthly uh, 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 as a monthly spend and I'm seeing really interesting or having interesting conversations with people going Oh, I shouldn't have this many. It doesn't feel right to have this many when they can see the rest of the world and lots of people having the uncertainty that I think there's a real band of, dare I use the word, middle class, people with decent salaries who haven't been furloughed, whose jobs aren't at risk and who perhaps uh, are in that space paying private school fees and using advice of people like us where they could, they're in a really perfect position to be transitioning into the space of being philanthropic. And we mustn't forget that philanthropy isn't always about giving the millions away. And I think that's sometimes where advisors get very nervous that they shouldn't start the conversation because they don't see their clients being in that ultra high net worth category where it's kind of okay to, to mention it. And, uh, see a lot of the, the the information that came out in the beacon reports around easter where actually the majority of wealthy people are only giving between a thousand and four thousand pounds a year anyway and that's split between 
maybe two, three different charities. So that entry level point mm -hmm. is a really interesting piece that I'm thinking a lot about at the moment. I think we, we should all be as an easy way in and an easy opener to conversations about uh, how we can advise and guide the clients as they move forward. I really like that. I was thinking about um, the sort of, because um, I think what I've sometimes heard with advisors is they kind of worry, they don't want to be guilting their clients. Um, yeah. So I guess what sort of resources and how do you think um, one can kind of uh, sort of take that step into that conversation? Well, I think going back to what Emma said, everybody needs an Emma or all. Uh, but somebody who is a, a professional philanthropy advisor and there are as well as people like Emma and myself who are working within specific companies there are independent philanthropy advisors out there and also I think often gets overlooked in these conversations is the community foundations who on a local and regional level particularly with en entry level new donors are a really natural place for people to look at uh, building relationships because people inevitably do build relationships locally it's a new people like to be able to touch and feel uh, what they're giving to uh, whilst taking on board what Emma says uh, uh, said earlier a lot of people don't quite know where to go because they've been so busy running their businesses uh, that they don't really know how to navigate the charitable sector what I do find in the 99% of cases is people know what causes they care about. We all have things that have affected our lives. And whilst we might not quite know how to navigate into the right charity at the right entry point and the right people to speak to, we know what causes we care about. And community foundations, as well as advice, independent philanthropy advisors, is a, is a good way in. And I think increasingly, we need to move away from the them and us and look more at the strategic partnerships uh, where fundraisers aren't freaked out by somebody wealthy walking into a room saying i want to have a conversation about how i can support your charity uh, also for us as advisors not to overlook the fact that philanthropy is not just about cash and actually I'm having interesting conversations not just about donations at the moment or with people who are trustees and actively involved in volunteering roles and they're really caring deeply about that their charity they want their charity to be one that survives so it is those sort of strategic conversations and i think as we get more sophisticated in this space in the uk we will become better between the the high net worth the advisors the fundraisers and the charities and the uh, endpoint recipients that we can sit more around the table as equals and become experts in all of our uh, different areas to make sure that the endpoint is never overlooked in terms of how we do the best that we can and make the best use of the money and the networks and skills that these high net worth individuals have. Absolutely, thank you. And um, Richard, um, for you, what have you seen? Um, as the kind of major concerns uh, facing your clients right now? Uh, thank you. Um, well, I think the sort of two major questions, apart from the obvious sort of, should I do it? How do I do it? types of questions are really about control and value. Mm -hmm. um, because typically wealthy people as people who are major donors, have been used to running their own businesses or having a very high degree of control in their in their personal lives and they don't see why that shouldn't apply to a charity and so you do have to explain that there does have to be an independent if you're going to set up your own foundation there does have to be an independent board um, you have to explain about the degree of regulation that can be off-putting to some people um, and uh, then they begin to look at it and say, well, wait a minute, I'm going to have, and I'm very clear that, you know, there is a certain amount of administration. Giving money away is not easy. It's, and uh, if you're going to do it effectively. And uh, if you don't want to, if you don't want to undertake the administration yourself, and if you don't want to entrust it to uh, a board of trustees or directors of your charitable foundation, then I think you should use a donor advised fund or a community foundation. There, are, there is plenty of infrastructure out there these days 
that it exists to help make it easy for people to give. And, uh, and I'm very keen on uh, having, in my younger days, I was very keen on encouraging um, uh, well-to-do would-be philanthropists to set up their own foundation. And having had to go through the rather painful process of unwinding them when they've been, they've been neglected, um, I now am much keener on using donor advised funds and community foundations and other intermediary organizations, sometimes as a stepping stone to having your own foundation, sometimes that's it. And uh, it means fewer legal fees, but I think that's probably, if that means my advice is more effective, I think that's better for the client. Um, people, I've had a number of clients over the years, one recently, sort of saying, where the, the client comes from a sort of fairly global family, where should I put my foundation? Um, and uh, you, there's obviously a, a, a realm of different jurisdictions that are happy to take your charitable foundation. And it's quite interesting to see how people come back to say, well, I just want the least amount of regular, start by saying I just want the least amount of regulation possible because that will reduce the cost. Um, and uh, then, then you sort of gently point out that they, they might possibly not be immortal. And uh, when they're not around to control it, are they happy that their kids or whoever it is um, who will then presumably be in charge should have completely untrammeled um, uh, control over it? And they say, oh, well, no, I'd want somebody to be doing an accounting function for them and so forth. And quite often they then come to back to the UK actually as being a place that's not a bad charitable jurisdiction. The great thing about the UK is we don't have the private foundation rules, which is the, one of the big drawbacks in the United States. Um, but we do have a sometimes over intrusive charity commission regulator. Um, and so I, I think it's control and value. And uh, again, um, here, it, here it's a question that uh, the, the client's looking at value both in terms of minimizing administration costs, if you can get through the regulation conversation with them, um, then uh, quite often they're happy to look at, you know, you set up, you say, well, these are the different costs that are depending on what you want your foundation to do. Um, and uh, if, you're, if you want to give money away, to, if you want to actively go out and seek um, really effective smaller charities, you're probably going to have some have to have some professional staff, just unless you're going to spend a lot of time doing that yourself. Um, or you should, or you should go for a donor, uh, or a community foundation, or something like that. Way they can they can help you with those. Um, alternatively, if you're just going to, if you've got a fairly passive program in mind, then maybe you can keep the cost fairly low. Um, value also in terms of how much impact are my gifts going to make, to which the answer is, well, it depends how much effort you've put into your gifts, how much effort you put into selecting your programs. Um, and so, so I think it's control and value are the two key things that I see clients focusing on. And, um, and I do think it's, it's very important to use the help that's there. Um, it's not easy giving away money. I just want to pick up on something Emma said earlier and to emphasize, I think it's absolutely impossible to tell which clients are going to turn out to be philanthropically minded and which not. Mm. I would clients were going to turn out to be those who were interested and those who weren't. One test is to ask them gently, do you give money to charity now? If they give not a, not a single penny to charity today, they're probably not going to want to give it later. Uh, another thing I was thinking about is that um, as to how much they give, I think sometimes it depends on whether they're self-made people or whether they, it's inherited one. Mm. If, it's, if it's money they've made themselves, they quite often think, they then quite often start by saying, how much do I want my kids to give? Mm -hmm. And once you start from that, then you say, okay, well, I want them to give 10 million, 50 million, whatever it is. Um, but I don't want them to get more than that. This is sort of the conversation that fairly clearly, you know, our people, well, high profile people in the US, such as Buffett and Gates. And, um, and if you start from there, then, um, then there is quite a, usually quite a big space for philanthropy. Mm -hmm. um, if you start from people who've sort of finally inherited a whole chunk of, whole pile of money, 
and uh, their goal is to, to pass it on to the next generation, having had a good time, having had sort of been able to use it in the meantime, um, then they're not going to be so philanthropic. So, um, people who uh, suddenly inherit something out of the blue may be the exception if it's a wind, almost like a windfall, um, uh, then it may be, uh, they may be more philanthropic. But, um, uh, it's very interesting to see that, but but uh, but can you predict it? I completely agree with Emma. Absolutely not. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, we don't have much time left at all. We just have five minutes. And I was just thinking, we've had a couple of really interesting questions about how we think the rules of philanthropic engagement might shift with younger generations. Um, and also, um, I think there's a question around is there a sense that people are kind of giving more locally rather than internationally at the moment so um happy for sort of any of the panelists to to jump in on that one um uh, i'm happy to take the first part of, yeah. of that if you want mm -hmm. uh i think the shift that we need to make and is hopefully being made as possibly a result of this pandemic is that for the first I'm, i've worked in philanthropy for 25 years plus and philanthropy has always kind of been a dirty word in most circles and i feel that this is a really exciting time in terms of philanthropy being celebrated for the first time in the uk and uh what i think or i'm hoping will be an outcome of this is that that celebration of what's going on and the outcomes will lead to philanthropists being more out and proud about their giving and being that very modern word influ becoming influencers yeah. and i think that's something if we can change the culture of philanthropy uh, as a result of the pandemic by bringing in new funders and being more proud as a nation of what we can do philanthropically then i think that's a really fabulous gift that will mean that the next generation will find it easier to find their peers so they're not as isolated in their giving and not to be embarrassed about giving to charity and having made money so that's something that i would really encourage in terms of conversations going back to again us as being advisors is that uh I think giving anonymously, there is a small, uh, you know, reason and purpose for people to give anonymously. But on the whole, I think people should be open and share and talk and teach their peer group. And I think if we can pass that on to the next generation who are generally more open and more connected, I think that will be one of the major differences in terms of uh, the culture of giving in the next generation that we should encourage. I think that's great and I think there's something about that sense of community which that brings also um, which would be really great. Um, Emma did you want to maybe pick up on the local versus international question? Um, well there's just a couple of things, a couple of questions about, so first of all I don't choose charities for clients, that's not part of my role, I teach them how to do it themselves and I think it's very important, that answers a few questions I think that have come up. Mm -hmm. Another thing I think that is critical is that what someone gives to charity bears no relation to their wealth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Lloyd Dorfman did not wake up one day and say, I'm going to give 10 million to the National Theatre. It took him 10 years. This is a long, slow journey that has to be meaningful for the donor and the charity has to be incredibly patient and let these people start giving at a level that they feel comfortable giving at. And that will grow in time if they trust you and like you and see that their money is going to make a difference. That's really important. And then I increasingly see that charity is beginning at home more and more. And I actually think the crisis will hone that because um, I think we're going to come out of this. And when we all start, you know, walking down the high street, we're going to see charity shops are not going to open again. It's going to be very messy, um, both in the business world and in the charity world. And a lot of charities will fail, I'm afraid, as businesses will. So charities are going to have to be nimble, they're going to have to be articulate, they're going to have to be really good at the ask. And I think then if they get someone's attention, then that relationship begins and there is no reason why that person should leave you for many years if you get it right. But it is quite hard work on the charity's part. Yeah, I agree with that. It's all about working alongside someone and really understanding their, their motivations and how you can match that with whatever your program is. Yeah. Thank you very much. John, would you like to close? I know we have like one minute left. 
Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for chairing this, and thank you, Emma, Lizzie, and Richard, for participating and adding a lot of value to this. I think what's really important in this, I think, other than the points that you were making, to reinforce that is that engaging new funders uh, from very wealthy people is, is, is going to be key to dealing with the aftermath of this. I think Emma's right. There's going to be a, a big change in the number of charities in, in existence. Some people are predicting 50% of them are going to close. But it's important, advisors have an important role to play in this. All the research is indicating that if they talk to their clients and support them on their donor journey, then they will um, help to increase the amount of giving and it will be better giving. So thank you very much everyone for participating and for making this really interesting. Thank you. Over to you, Sophia. Yeah, I echo John in saying thank you all for joining us and for the conversation today. Thank you all in the chat as well for your questions. I'll be, any ones that haven't been answered, I'll be transferring over to LinkedIn. And I invite all of you panellists to come and maybe have a say there, please, if you have a moment. Um, I'd also like to just highlight that we are coming back to doing bigger events. Um, they are still online as we're in COVID. And the next one is on the 27th of May with McFarlane's. And it's about ambitious family philanthropy. We'll be putting out some notifications about that, but we'd love to see you all there. Thank you again and goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.